In this very prosperous world, it's shocking to realize that billions of people live without access to electricity, without clean drinking water, and endure many other, many other privations that we in the developed world take for granted. I'm here today with Kathleen Hartnett White, who is Distinguished Fellow in Residence at the Texas Public Policy Foundation and also Director of the Armstrong Center for Energy and Environment. Kathleen is a past chair and a commissioner of the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality and was a member of the Texas Water Development Board, among serving in other prestigious posts. You can see the link on our site for her complete bio. Also happy to uh, announce that Kathleen is co-author with Stephen Moore of a new book, Fueling Freedom, Exposing the Mad War on Energy, which will be released on May 23rd, and we'll be sure that you have more information on that through IEDC. Kathleen, thanks so much for taking the time to visit with me today. My pleasure. It's a pleasure Appreciate to speak it. to you again. Yes. So we're here to talk about energy poverty. It's a huge problem. Maybe as many as two billion people might suffer from this. What is energy poverty, Kathleen? Energy poverty is now used to describe really a number of different um, conditions in which people, basic physical living conditions. As you mentioned, across the world, I see various counts, but one to three billion of the Earth's now 7.4 billion people either have no access to electricity or very, very inadequate. I notice in, in the newspaper today that Venezuela now is having forced blackouts and having what they call the five-day weekend, sending government employees home and all of that. They have an inadequate supply. But it is amazing, given the importance of access to electricity, which, which really kind of runs through our lives like the metabolism in the body or the exactly. nervous system, exactly. everything. It's not at just the moment we take a hot shower, mm -hmm. but the clothes we wear and the world has now been filled, I think, with enormous benefits of, of man-made energies that um, affect the food we eat, the clothes we wear, mm -hmm. the work we do, where we're standing. And to think that that many um, um, people in the world have no electricity and rely on still on wood or woody brush in cook stoves, in unventilated homes. Um, you know, the greatest health problems in the world are contaminated drinking water and uncontrolled sewage. And to tr we've conquered that for the most part in the Western world, but it takes electricity in, in the water treatment and the sewage treatment plants. So we have a real gap, a gulf, if you will between those in the world that for the last 50 years have, have, even if they're poorer than we are in the United mm -hmm. States, an increasing standard of living, an increasing income per capita, and increasing access to electricity. But we still have a very large part, 40%, yeah. maybe 30% of every human being in the world that lacks what to us is just an assumed foundation of our lives. Huge numbers, Kathleen. And of course, we in the United States, those and people in Western Europe, by and large, and some other pockets around the world, take for granted these kind of benefits. Are there particular areas around the world where the energy poverty is, is worse than There elsewhere? are, but I, I might raise an additional issue uh, about energy poverty, which is um, shocking. Uh, one of the things that inspired me to write the book is that as a result of climate policies, to rapidly displace fossil fuels as the generating mm -hmm. source for electricity in countries as affluent and as a much like the United States, energy poverty is growing in Germany. You can Google energy poverty in Germany and you'll see stories about how electricity became a luxury good. And you can Google under the category again Germany's energy poverty, 800,000 to a million households no longer can afford electricity. Their rates in Germany are three times, not 30 percent, three times, three times higher than they are uh, is the average rate in this country, and they no longer um, can and are burning fuel. Some of which they would they're burning wood fuel um, and also using um, which you know, doesn't help climate change at all. No, no, not, not at all. These stories get complicated, yeah. but the for, as a what I consider purely political uh, decision, the European Union, the United Nations declared wood as carbon neutral on the assumption that if you burn a tree, you can just plant a tree. It's just not quite that simple at all. <laughs> but it is actually within the, the broader European Union, Germany and the, and the United Kingdom have gone farther to aggressively um, mm -hmm. deploy renewables. Their electric rates have gone like this, and what they call, as the government defines as energy poverty, which is 
uh, along the lines of something like 10% of more of your income, discretionary income, goes just for energy, your energy for wow. your mobility or your, and that is, that is really shocking to me. That's very shocking. So in some developed nations, we have an artificial political yeah. force pushing to people away right. from the convenience of electricity and fuels. But what about elsewhere in the world? People who are maybe economically deprived, is there a challenge there? There's a real, um, not only a real challenge, but there's certainly broad recognition, and I would say longing and recognition that you have to have, and it's not just electricity, but that's a good one to focus on, because that's, that's the turnkey for exactly. so much imp improvement, and are just longing um, to be able to bring that. They know that's the first thing they have to bring, and for uh, regions which can can economic develop, even on a small scale, you've mm -hmm. got to have lighting, among other services electricity provides. China or India, of course, are the developing giants. Um, China, which many people perhaps have read, have been building, uh, at one point they were building a, a thousand megawatt coal-fired power plant a week that has slowed down, but there still are, regardless of all that's recently gone on about a supposedly grand climate agreement, reached in Paris through the United Nations. China and India b both admit that they, they plan hundreds and hundreds more coal-fired power plants because they are, uh, they'll gener generate reliably so much more electricity um, than renewables can. The gap between those countries and, and Western countries, I think, is, is, is one that can be closed um, if we help if you will, transfer the technologies we've developed in this country to reduce the real emissions that can harm human health. Because I indeed think uh, clean coal is, is a reality when that this um, array of, of a number of very complicated emission control technologies are used. They're expensive, but, but they work. The point of concern about developing countries' pursuit of electrification is that now a lot of the major funding sources which to provide financing, like at the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, to provide financing for power projects, for plants themselves, transmission, all of that, are now being conditioned on whether they, they install renewables rather than coal or natural gas. And I think that also is tragic because that is not only elevating the, the price of electricity in those countries, but the use of renewables is just plain not as reliable and as diverse and versatile as uh, electricity from steady, steady state mm -hmm. fuels. And that, of course, includes uranium as well as coal and natural gas. But I don't know how that will all turn out, but um, I think that that is it's it's worse than worse when people are already so disadvantaged than to say here here's some money but you can only use it on something yeah. that it's not going to really cover your needs sure well you mentioned kathleen about you know the the dangers of some indoor pollution we'll talk briefly on that what are some of the other impacts that, that people suffer or shortened lifespan or from the lack of electricity, clean well, water, and so there's on. been lots of studies that show that uh, as important as income per capita is access, so we all know access to food is, but energy is really it's obviously a form of food without which humans can't, uh, can't survive, but, but that's true with energy, true and always has, but before the, the creative harnessing of fossil fuels in so many creative, creative devices like the steam engine, uh, the most famous, people still needed energy just as much as we do now. Mm -hmm. Their source was so limited. That was wood. Wood was the sole s source of, of thermal energy. There was um, hydroelectric, if you will. There were dams. There were also water wheels. Water there wheels, were also sure. windmills, but they, for thousands of years, in fact, their contribution was always marginal. It was here, it, energy remained inherently scarce. And it, it all coming from natural sources, which we can't control, we can't store them. Mm -hmm. We have to wait till they're there and use them the best we have. So uh, many historians will say that, the, that really the way you can define the distinction between pre-industrial humanity and post-industrial humanity is the industrial revolution opened the doors that made energy abundant and affordable and accessible mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and it increased food supply as much as it did you know basic uses for for uh, in industrial process for manufacturing whether it's a little cottage industry or whether it's a massive one yeah changed Cer everything ch certainly put the lie to the uh, malthusian and predictions of starvation question on a about global basis. Trying to understand it, uh, just how fundamental, important this is. The lifespan around 1800, which is the most common date for the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, 
was only about 25 to 35 years old across the world. And not because there weren't old people, but because uh, largely because 40% um, of all children died before they reached maturity. That is now three times longer. Um, yes, we are about five or seven years promised lifespan in Western countries, but the, the improvement is across the board. The United Nations, in their more sober moments, admits that not only lifespan and income per capita, but education, literacy, you name you know, the basic measures of human well-being have increased more in the, for the poor of the world, have increased more in the last 50 years than the last 500 years. And to risk that energy foundation is, is I think, the, the, really the question before us that's not received as much attention. And that increase in humanity's well-being correlates very nicely with increased use of fossil fuels. Absolutely. Does it not? Absolutely. Yeah. What are some solutions, Kathleen, to kind of reducing or eliminating energy poverty around the world? As I mentioned earlier, for those poor countries, not, not for aggressive, radical climate policies in Western Europe, but I think we can, you know, people use, have used the phrase for, for many decades, technology transfer. But I think we, we developed in this country and in Europe, but we were really the pioneers of, again, all this technology where you can burn coal, you can burn natural gas, you can um, use uranium in a very, very clean manner, um, generate electricity. And that's what, to me, needs to be coupled. The opportunity in um, developed countries to um, have access to um, whether they have the fuel source or not, most of them have coal, and, and or you can use petroleum responsibly to develop, um, to generate electricity, which they do not surprisingly in Saudi mm -hmm. Arabia and, and other Middle Eastern countries. If you use this suite of uh, emission controls, you can do so very cleanly, cleanly in the sense of not risking human health. The concern, of course, with climate policies is not sulfur dioxide, but carbon dioxide. Yes. And carbon dioxide is, is in, in my uh, assessment, is in no way a pollutant. It is a harmless, invisible gas that is actually the, the catalyst for the growth of plants through photosynthesis, which is the food base of, of all life on, on this earth. Bottom line of the right. food pyramid. Exactly. Huh? Yeah. And the efficiency gains that we have um, developed in the, in the Western world for um, operating electric generating play, plants yeah. is also a way of reducing pollution. You use less energy per unit of generation, you're going to perforce reduce emissions. And in, in that respect, our country has actually reduced man-made carbon dioxide emissions faster than most European countries that are actually trying, mm -hmm. uh, trying to directly reduce CO2 because of our efficiency. We've been going down since 1949. Um, the Energy Information Administration has that because we get more and more and more efficient. We use less fuel, we spend less money, we get more product. Well, Kathleen, you're razor sharp, really more like a needle when it comes to puncturing <laughs> myths and misconceptions, which I think you do in your new book, which you've been laboring hard on, whoa, these many months and beyond. Which, can you tell us a little bit about the new book? I'd be happy to, and, and it was spawned by this paper that I had written earlier about which I spoke to your members about the, the ethical issues um, surrounding fossil fuels and the climate policies. And I was asked, would you extend that to a paper? And I thought, well, what a wonderful opportunity. And so, so here we go. It's called Fueling Freedom, Exposing the Mad War on Energy, yeah. because it's really... A, bizarre to me, I think a kind of madness and of absurdity that we, that uh, our mainstream media, our elites, whether they're celebrities or political figures or major uh, voices in the media, have just vilified um, not only fossil fuels, but the industries that develop fossil fuels. And it's, um, it's to me, it really baseless. There are bad apples in any industry. And we, it took time to learn how to control what our extractive industries and, and uh, productive industries. But we really have done so. And it took, it took prosperity <laughs> to be able to have, you know, the poorest people in the world don't usually have really clean gardens. Yeah. They're down to, they're <laughs> down to the, the basics. Um, but prosperity, um, I think, through, through um, the economic freedom we've enjoyed in the United States more than anywhere else, competitive markets, yes, capitalism, another term mm -hmm. that is so, so vilified, was, was, had, we've really had a win-win, and that's why I would call it fueling freedom. That this, in some ways, a historical coincidence when the, um, the kind of constitutional 
and political structure under which we live, a representative democracy with free markets, right. which guarantee the inalienable rights of the human individual. Each human individual is inherently valuable. That, com that, that, that combination of, of political theory or policy conjoined with um, the magic of abundant, versatile, controllable, reliable fossil fuels has been has changed the world like nothing, nothing, nothing else. And people will say, "Oh, well, that's just physical conditions, you know." And it's produced all this excessive consumption in Western societies. If consumption is a choice, you're lucky because most of the people live without. Um, but you can consume for a variety of purposes, and people have different opinions on whether they are worthwhile or not worthwhile. But you know, I think it's the most profound gift of the rich, abundant energy in fossil fuels, time. I came across a number, and this is kind of material in the book, that in 1900, the, the average work week in an average factory was 72 hours a week, six 12 hours a day. I mean, that's not a material condition, but that's time. That's hardly any we're, life. We're slackers, aren't yeah. we? <laughs> and you didn't come home to prepare foods you could pull out of the freezer or electric exactly. dishwashers or washing machines you then had to keep working. That to me is that time because now we have machines and, and various forms of energy that do the work that we otherwise would have to do ourselves. We're given that time and when you have time you have choice. You don't necessarily have to be massively wealthy but you can choose <laughs> what you want to do rather than just live a life of physical labor, whether it's personal labor for your home, and much of the world um, still lives that way. Well, there certainly are a lot of people who use their celebrity to pound that drum against the fossil fuel industry, and specifically often oil and gas. So, so it's great to see someone coming forward to talk about the realities and what life would be without these types of fuels. So thanks so much for your time, Kathleen. You're brilliant as always, and uh, I know our listeners are going to enjoy hearing your thoughts. And thanks to all of you for uh, tuning in here today and listening to this webcast. Be on the alert for Fueling Freedom, which will be available on May 23rd and, in fact, is now available for pre-order on Amazon.com and probably other sites. Thanks again for tuning in. Keep turning to the right and be safe. Bye-bye.